Okay, so friends, we are continuing today in our series, the book of Ephesians. And if you've been with us for the past few weeks, then you would have read and seen the Apostle Paul, the person who wrote the letter of Ephesians that we're studying, really hone in on the theme of gospel community, right? Gospel unity. That's been chapters three to four or so. Paul's been saying that this, this gospel unity, is actually one of the biggest proofs that the gospel's taken root in a community. When the gospel is taken root in a community, we wouldn't just feel nice, warm, and fuzzy feelings in our hearts, okay? Uh, we won't just uh, uh, experience other kinds of growths, like numerical growth. If God gives that to us, then amen, praise him. But the main litmus test that measures whether or not the gospel's infiltrated a community is how many people in that community has the gospel produced to be robust men and women who has gracious speech? How many men and women in that community has been built up to be able to long suffer and forgive and endure and prioritize each other through the nitty gritty of relational complexities? That's the litmus test for whether or not the gospel has transformed your community. You got a lot of people like that around, okay? And for the sake of the sermon today, let's call these people that Paul's been trying to describe for the past two chapters or so, with gracious speech and all that kind of stuff, let's call these people agents of shalom, okay? Agents of shalom. And every community desperately need these agents of shalom within it in order to survive. And by the way, do you know anyone like that here, in this community, perhaps, Someone who can seem to lead even the most volatile conversations into a peaceful conclusion without anyone involved feeling cut aside or disrespected. You know someone like that? Someone who, when they speak, somehow makes everyone else in the room feel more heard. You know anyone like that? Someone who can address very serious issues in the community with calming grace because they don't take themselves too seriously as they do it. Someone who seem can be able to build you up even through the quickest interactions throughout the day. Do you know people like that? They're called agents of shalom. And that's the kind of person Paul's been trying to describe for the past two chapters or so. And what I believe Paul's doing here in our passage today is he's giving us insight into what you and I must resolve to doing, and what you and I must commit to doing if we want to become these agents of shalom that Paul's been describing the past few chapters, okay? If we want to become these people for our communities, these people don't just appear out of thin air. You don't just believe in Jesus and then turn into an agent of shalom, all right? Here are some things Paul's telling us here that we've got to personally resolve and commit to doing if we want to become these kinds of people that our church and our communities desperately need, okay? What are they? What is it? What must we do? Well, let's take a look at it. This is God's word. Just five verses taken from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 to 20. It's God's word. Paul says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thus says the Lord. Okay, so this is a bit of a transitional passage where Paul kind of closes off his thought process from the previous passage before he continues on to the next thought process. Okay, it's a bit of a transition, so it's going to feel a bit choppy. But we'll try our best uh, to capture Paul's train of thought here, okay? There are at least, I think, four resolves that we see in our passage today that we must commit to doing if we want to become these agents of shalom, okay? What are they? First, we must be a redeemer of our time. Second, we got to be a wise discerner of God's will. Third, we got to be an intricate member of a local church. And lastly, we got to be a thankful child of God. Okay, these are the four things I think we see here, things we must do to become 
an agent of shalom. All right, first, to become an agent of shalom, we must be a redeemer of our time. So the first thing Paul tells us to do here to become an agent of shalom is in verse 15. Look at it. He says, look carefully then how we walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Okay. Now that phrase, making the best use of the time, there in our English translations, it it gets the same idea across, but it doesn't quite picture and fully grasp what Paul is trying to paint here in the original Greek. In the Greek, the phrase, making the best use of the time, actually translates to redeem the time, to purchase back the time. The phrase is actually, Paul says, we must ex agora zomenoi, the time. Okay, Paul says here. Now, pay attention to the prefix ex there in the beginning of the verb, ex agora zomenoi. What does ex mean? Ex means to take out, right? Like to exit, to retrieve, or quite literally, to buy out time. Take it out, buy it out, redeem it, Paul says. But from what? What are we supposed to redeem or ex time out of? Well, continue reading the verse. He says, from the evil day. So it's kind of this interesting concept where where Paul's saying that when you wake up in the morning, this morning, the next 24 hours or so that you got is still imprisoned by the evil one, is still being held captive behind the bars of evil. And it is your job to redeem that time. It is your job to use your time in such a way to where you free it from its imprisoned captivity. Interesting picture, isn't it? A thought I should remind myself every day whenever my thumb just automatically goes to Instagram after I turn off my uh, alarm. Be wise. Don't be foolish. Use your time well. Look carefully how you walk, Paul says. So, so the picture of time that we're given here is a little bit different than what we generally envision time to be. When we usually think of time, I think at least, we usually think of this railroad or this highway that we must ride on. But Paul's saying here, no, 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 that's too neutral a picture of time. Time is rather a treasure unyet redeemed from the evil one. And notice Paul says here that the days are evil, not the day, singular, but the days, plural. Now, that's intentional. Paul's trying to say that this is a continuous battle. He's, trying, he's saying that just because you use your time well on Tuesday, it doesn't mean that you wake up on Wednesday and your time's redeemed from the past usage of Tuesday. No, no, no. Wednesday is new time, freshly captivated by the evil day, and you've got to redeem it all over again. It's, it's, it's this um, intense picture about how to use your life. And we hear this, and we say, man, Tez, that's motivating. You know, I'm, I feel a bit motivated from that. But also, I feel really exhausted <laughs> just by hearing that. Because, you know, this idea of redeeming time, it's like, I can't rest. Ever? Like, I just got to constantly work, 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 work all the time to redeem my time? Well... The question is, why do you automatically assume that redeeming your time here means more work? I don't think it necessarily means that. Redeeming your time could mean a million things. It could mean, for example, spending more time with your children. Maybe in particular moments, that's the best of your your time. It could mean spending your time reading your Bible more or praying. It could mean spending your time investing it toward a healthier marriage. It could also mean working more. I don't know. Or it could mean resting more. Depending on your situation, redeeming your time, spending your time faithfully for the Lord may look differently in different seasons, which leads us to our next point. How can you know what redeeming your time looks like at a given moment? It's hard to know for sure because the locks to the prison door that holds your time captive seem to shape-shift constantly, doesn't it? It's always changing. 
and you never know, it's hard to precisely know what God wants you to do with your time at a given moment. So let's go to our second point, which is why Paul said, in order to be agents of shalom, you must redeem your time, but you also must be wise discerners of God's will. All right? Second point. Excuse me for a second. A wise discerner of God's will. Let's continue down in our text to verse 17. After Paul says, redeem your time, he says, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now notice in the text, the command to not be foolish in verse 17 and the command to be wise in verse 15 sandwiches the command to redeem time in verse 16. Okay? What does that mean? Well, Paul's saying here that, yeah, he's agreeing with you. It is confusing. It's hard to know what to do, how to do it, what to say, how to say it, when to say it. The prison locks that hold your time captive shapeshift constantly. And that's why you got to be wise in understanding, in discerning what the will of the Lord is. Second time he's repeated this theme, by the way, in the past chapter. So what does that mean, you know, to become wise in understanding the will of the Lord? How do you do that? Well, see, wisdom in the Bible, and we've talked about this a few times before, wisdom refers to this idea of skill, okay? And like the developing of any skill, first of all, what you got to do is you got to know the basics, okay? That's mandatory. You can't be a skilled pianist if you don't understand the basics of musical scales, You can't be a skilled lawyer unless you understand the basic laws of the country that you're practicing in. You can't be a skilled doctor unless you understand the basics of human biology. Wisdom requires you knowing the basics. But wisdom in the Bible goes beyond that. Knowing the basics is foundational, but it's not the end. Wisdom also refers and covers the instinctive know-how that you've developed after the basics have become second nature to you. For example, your grandma can give me her favorite recipe that she's cooked for the past 40 years with precise detail. And I can try my best to follow that recipe down to the T, cook it in the same exact kitchen she cooked it in, with the same exact appliances that she used, but I guarantee you, it will not taste the same. Why not? Wisdom. Wisdom is that skill that one cannot simply get from you just by you explaining the steps to them. It's not instantly transferable in that sense. You can try to teach it and explain it, but at some point, you always find yourself going over and over again, man, I'm sorry, I don't know what to tell you. You just got to do it for like 10 years. Then maybe you'll get it. Okay. So back to our passage. When Paul says you got to be wise in understanding what the will of the Lord is, what do you think he means? Well, again, at the very least, it means you got to know the basics. You got to know the actual rules, laws, the musical scales of figuring out what the will of the Lord is. Now, where can you find the basics of that, by the way? Where can you find the rules and the laws and the musical scales of figuring out what God's will is? In the Bible, God's word. And be very careful before you go, Tez, you know, for me, I I don't really need to know the Bible that well because God speaks to me in here. You know, I just kind of follow my gut. How would you like it if your surgeon says that the next time before heart surgery. You know, he just goes, look, I really don't know the basics. I don't know the skills, you know, about human biology and the heart, but don't worry. I'm going to really follow my gut on this one. Would you be happy with that? Would you be comfortable with that? Of course not, and you shouldn't. I'm not saying gut feeling has no place. It does. That's what actually wisdom means. But even impromptu jazz only works 
when the musicians mastered the basics. Do you know the basics of figuring out God's will? Do you know your Bibles? Have you studied it? Is it muscle memory to you? It's got to be, okay? Well, see, Tez, that's what I pay you to do. You see, I don't know if you know how this works. I tithe to the church. The church pays you so that you have the time to study the Bible and tell me what God's will is for my life. And look, I love you, and I will do my best to help you navigate through various scenarios in your life. But do you really think you can become agents of shalom that way? See, that's why Paul says here, it's not just about having the answers. It's about becoming the kind of man and woman who can find the answers for themselves. That's what wisdom is, which, by the way, is what being filled up by the Spirit here means. You've got to interpret that verse to be filled up with the Spirit in light of the context of this passage and the rest of the book, okay? And remember, in Ephesians, whenever Paul talks about being filled up by Christ or being filled up by God, he's not talking about emotional fulfillment, never. In Ephesians, it's rather this idea of potential fulfillment, like filling up to becoming all who we can be for the purposes of gospel unity. That's always the context. Remember Ephesians 4.13? Paul says we all got to labor until we attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So to be filled up in the fullness of Christ or to be filled up with the Spirit here in Ephesians 4 or to be filled up with the fullness of God in Ephesians 3 always refers to each of us maturing in the faith in such a way to where we become unified, okay? That's the context. And Paul's saying, you'll never get there. You'll never mature and be filled up in that way, he puts it crassly here in verse 18, if you treat your time on earth like one big drunken party. Don't be drunk with wine. That's debauchery but be filled up, grow up with the Spirit, or more accurately, I think, in the Spirit. There's a growth process that happens when you put yourself in the realm of the Spirit instead of in the realm of debauchery. So, let's summarize. A lot of harsh rebukes here from Paul, yes, but it's good. One, he says, use your time wisely. Redeem it. Take it out of the clutches of evil. Why? So that you can mature in wisdom, so that you can live up to the potential of who you can be, to become men and women who instinctively know what God wants them to do at any given moment. You show me someone like that, and I'll show you an agent of shalom. Why? Because this is exactly the kind of people who would instinctively know what God's will is relationally as well. He has this, or she has this gut feeling about what to say, how to say it, when to say it, who should say it, in what intensity should it be said, or even if it needs to be said at all. Is that gut instinctive for you? Agents of shalom must be wise discerners of God's will. Are you? Okay. So, be a redeemer of time, Paul says. Be... (coughs) Be wise discerner of God's will. And third, he continues in the passage, be an intricate member of a local church. Where do we see that? Let's go to our third point. Continue the verse in the passage. Go to verse 19. Paul says, Address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Now, what is that? Well, that's a description of a local church worship service. The Psalms, they're referring to singing the actual Psalms, like from the Old Testament, which, by the way, in light of this passage, we're going to do just that in our fifth song after the sermon. We're going to sing a song that's based on Psalm 150. Sing the Psalms together. Sing hymns, spiritual songs, make melodies to the Lord. This is a description of a local church worship service. And what Paul's saying here is this, at least this, this growth this wise spending of the time, this, this filling up into maturity and wisdom, 
None of that can happen in solitude. It's got to happen in the context of a worshiping church community. Notice Paul doesn't just say, sing hymns, psalms, spiritual songs. He said, address one another in hymns and psalms and spiritual songs. Well, what does that mean? One, at the very least, it means that you must have a relationship with people in your local church so tightly, so intricately that you address one another and you adorn your interactions with them in godly beauty. Okay? Yes, it means that. But also, I think a minor note here is that you should be so relationally intertwined in your worshiping local church community to where you experience a sort of fellowship even as you worship. There's a oneness that happens when you sing from your heart to the Lord. When we sang earlier, for example, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. You know what I thought of? I thought of some of you here who I know is making huge vocational sacrifices because you're trying to consecrate your life to the Lord. Some of you I know are making huge relational sacrifices because you're trying to align love and marriage towards what the Lord says it should be about. When we sang earlier, he is my solid ground through the fiercest drought and storm, you knew who I thought of? Andrew and Tiffany who's currently taking care of uh, their baby daughter who has severe medical complications. They're desperately looking for a solid ground. Though that might be a minor note here in this passage, I think the point is you should be so intricately intertwined and connected to other people in your church community to where you do everything Paul just commanded within that context, okay? So when you ask the question, how do I make best use of my time? Ask it in the context of your church community. How do I make best use of my time as an intricate member of this worshiping gospel community? How do I figure out what God's will is for my life as an intricate member of this worshiping gospel community? That's the point here. And you're absolutely right. Asking these questions in the comfort of your own room, in the lonesome of your own solitude, will be tidier and less messy. Of course, you get hurt bad asking those questions in community. Things are messier in community. There's more room for mistakes in community. But look, if you haven't figured it out by now, that's what the path toward wisdom looks like. The path toward wisdom is paved by the tweaking of a thousand mistakes. The path toward wisdom is paved by the tweaking of a thousand mistakes. Relational complications are opportunities for your heart to grow up in wisdom. So, make best use of your time and grow up as a wise discerner of God's will in the context of a worshiping church community. And ask all those questions about how to spend my time, about how to use my life with the names and the faces of other members of your local church community in mind. That's the flow here, I believe. But lastly, Paul says, to become an agent of shalom, not only must you be a redeemer of your time, not only must you be a wise discerner of God's will, not only must you be an intricate member of a church community, but also you've got to be a thankful child of God, which leads us to our last point. Thankful child of God. Okay. After Paul gives us all of these imperatives, all of these commands to follow, he closes off this section by saying, give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, at face value, this might just seem like a generic closing sentence Paul had to tag there on the end, but it's much more profound than that. Okay, thankfulness to God, I want to argue, is the foundation for all of this. Because see, if you're not thankful, likelihood is you're not going to make best use of your time, you're not going to want to bother yourself trying to discern God's will, and you're not going to want to put yourself into the messiness of fellowship and worship. 
Why? Because if you're not thankful, that implies that you don't believe what you own is a gift. And if you don't believe that your time, for example, is a gift, if you don't believe that your relationships or your money or your comforts, if you, if you think those things are yours and yours alone that you've earned to do and to will with it however you like, the urgency to want to make best use of your time, to want to figure out how to, bis, uh, how to best live life in your church community, et cetera, et cetera, will be much less urgent to you. Why? Because you think it's your time. You think it's your life. You think it's your stuff. You think it's your money. So why bother? But if you're thankful, you see constantly, Paul says here in verse 19, give thanks always, he says. That shows that you believe your time, every millisecond of it, your stuff, your life, your relationships, your kid, your spouse, all of it was a gift from God for you to steward and not a thing for you to rule and own for yourself. And look, honestly, this is it. This really is it. For most people, the reason why we're not spending our time actively seeking God's will, it's not because we're lazy. I don't think any of you here are lazy. Like, 99% of you are hard-working, functioning professionals. The reason why we, we're not concerned about seeking God's will, it's not because you're lazy. It's because you're not thankful. You're not, we're not thankful. We think this is ours. And you know why I think that is? We lack thankfulness, at least for me. This is why I like thankfulness, urgently. is because I think deep inside, it's hard to give thanks for a gift that we know was costless. You know, at least that's for me. Okay, God gave us our time. He gave us our money. He gave us our friends and our family. And we think to ourselves, you know, I'm thankful for these things, God, but you know, none of these things actually cost you anything to give. You know, it didn't cost you anything to give me 24 hours today. It didn't cost you anything to give me this job I have to provide for myself and my family. It didn't cost you anything to give my spouse and my kids. So thank you, but also like, thanks. You know, that's kind of what we feel. Which is, I think, why it's so important for us to really ponder here what Paul says at the end of this verse. Look at what he said here. What did Paul tell us to specifically give thanks for? He said, give thanks and for everything, always, to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, you are absolutely right. Your time, your money, your family, your stuff, it didn't cost God anything to give you any of those things. But Paul's reminding you here, do you know what cost him everything? Do you know what cost God the Father, his only begotten son, Jesus Christ? It's your sins. It's paying for your sins and for my sins. Give thanks to God, Paul says here, in the name of Jesus. Jesus who was given to you by God so that you could even call him Father at all. Don't forget that. See, your heart will never find this deep commitment to want to redeem your time from the clutches of evil unless you first realize what it cost God to redeem your life from the clutches of death. You won't have this deep commitment to figuring out what God's will is for your life unless you first see Jesus obeying God's will to the point of death, even death on a cross, so that he could give you life. You will not make melody in your heart 
to the Lord unless you first see Jesus keep his mouth shut and stay silent as he was led to the slaughter like a lamb on your behalf. And you won't bother throwing yourself into a local church community unless you first see that this community is the body of this Jesus who loved and died for you. It won't work. You can't will power yourself into these things. Do you see him? Are you constantly giving thanks to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus? Our problem isn't that we're lazy. Our problem is that we're not thankful. Let's use our time well, friends. We only have so much of it. You know, every time I talk to people <coughs> who's above 60 or 70, they always say the same thing to me. They always look at me in the eyes and say, it's so quick, Tez. You think you got all this time, and suddenly you're at the back end of it. You don't have that much of it. Use it wisely, Paul says. Spend it for the sake of building up the body of Christ on earth. You only have a few more years left, and it's like a vapor. And in a church where the majority of us are younger, this is a truth that so easily evades our hearts. Let not youth make you forget your finitude. You only have so much of it. Let me end with the words of the Apostle James, and then we'll pray. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go into such and such a town and spend a year there, or trade and make profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. O oh, you who boast tomorrow's gain, tell me, what is your life? A mist that vanishes at dawn, all glory be to Christ. Let's pray. Father, how foolish have we been when we look at the way we spent our time, <clears throat> how much of it has been spent doing the things that we believe is most important, all the while not realizing that the compass of our hearts were broken to begin with. Help us, Father, become wise. Help us treat our lives and our time here on earth with the value it deserves. Help us redeem and buy our time out of the clutches of the evil one. And let us cherish your body on earth. For if we love you, we will feed your sheep. We pray all these things now, Father, by your grace. Because neither youth or old age in itself can give us wisdom. But only the fear of the Lord instigated by the spirit that is in us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.